We love scriptable objects around here, and we feel that they are often underused. In this video, we are going to yet again make a scriptable object, but this time it's just going to hold a single value. This could be a float, an integer, maybe a color, or any other type of value that may be used throughout your project. Now this may seem a bit silly, but this turns a value into a project-wide asset and not just a value on a single instance of a class. With this approach, the value can be used on any object anywhere in the project. So changing the value on the asset can effectively change the value used by all objects in the project. This could be used for UI colors, NPC stats, or even audio clips and materials, whatever fits the need of your current project. Now this is great and can be useful in itself, but we're going to go a step further. We're going to create an object that toggles between using a value and a reference. This will allow the designer to use the value stored in the scriptable object or quickly switch to a custom value for a particular instance. Now this idea isn't original or something that we came up with, but rather it comes from Ryan Hipple who presented at Unite Austin in 2017, and we'll make sure to include a link to that video in the description below. And of course, we're also going to be leveraging Odin to make this process quicker, easier, and do it with a bit more polish than might otherwise be possible. So once we have our scriptable object, we next need to make a class that can handle the scriptable object and provide toggling between a color value and the scriptable object. And this is where Odin comes in and makes the task much easier. This class will have two generic arguments, tValue and tAsset, where tAsset is restricted to be a type of the value asset scriptable object. Just like with the scriptable object, these generic arguments will help create a parent class that other classes can inherit from while providing easier customization. This class will have a handful of fields. The first is a boolean that will toggle between using the color value or the reference to the scriptable object. The next will be of type tValue and we'll call it underscore value to reinforce that this is the value and not the reference to the scriptable object. Then comes a tAsset type which is where we'll be dropping in the scriptable object. Next are two optional fields to allow editing of the scriptable object directly in the inspector. Those include a boolean and another tAsset type. This second tAsset field will have the same value as the one above, but will make use of an inline editor attribute to display it in the inspector, thus allowing editing of the scriptable object. We need to create the dropdown list for the boolean, and we can do this by creating a field of the type value dropdown list and adding two values to the list. A public property of the type tValue will control which value is returned, the value on this class or the value on the scriptable object. If the scriptable object is null or the useValue option is true, then we'll return the value from this class. Otherwise, we'll return the value from the scriptable object. This class needs a function that will ensure that the two asset fields will have the same reference. This will get called by an attribute that we'll add in just a bit. With all the fields and functions created, we need to add in our attributes. Since all of our fields are protected and all need to be viewed in the inspector, we can add a serialized field attribute to each one. Then starting back at the top with the useValue boolean, we can add a hide label, a value dropdown that gets its values from the value list, and we can add it to a horizontal group as well. For the tValue field, we can hide the label, add it to the horizontal group, and give it a show if. The tAsset field will get a hide label, an on value changed that updates the other tAsset field, as well as a horizontal group, and finally, a hide if, which we'll use to control its visibility. The edit asset boolean will get a different label width, as well as a show if attribute. The last attributes to be added will be on the second tAsset field. We can add an inline editor so we can see and edit the values of the scriptable object, plus a show if and an enable if to control the visibility and accessibility. With the attributes added, we can add one more bit of functionality that can come in handy if this pattern is going to be widely used throughout a project. We can create an implicit cast from value reference to tValue or the value held by the value reference. This will mean that we don't have to use the dot value accessor since a value reference will implicitly cast to the value. This adds an extra bit of polish and will make the system just that much easier to use. Now so far we've created two abstract classes, so we can't create instances of those classes. So next we need to inherit from those classes in order to create scriptable objects and create instances of the value reference to be used in other classes. As an example of how the system could work, we are going to focus on toggling between a color value and a color reference. 
and then create an example that implements this to update UI colors. For our color example, we can make a new class, like so. This class will inherit from value asset, but with a generic argument of color. For ease of use, we can also add a create asset menu attribute to allow us to easily create an instance of the scriptable object. With this generic class created, we need to create a new class to hold our color reference. This new class will inherit from the value reference and pass in two generic arguments, like so. We can also use the attribute system.serializable so this class can be displayed in the inspector. If you want to extend this pattern to other types of classes, all that needs to be done is the addition of a new value asset class and a new value reference class. After that, the class and its easy to use inspector will be available to other classes. And that's pretty much it. So let's take a look at one use of the system. With the example of a color value, one use might be to manage the colors used in a basic UGUI element, such as text or an image. Let's create a new class that can be added to either type and we'll set the color using our new color reference class. Our class will need two fields, one of the type color reference and the second of the type graphic, which both image and text inherit from and contain the color field for both of those elements. We can then create an adjust color function. This function will check if the graphic variable is null. If it is, it'll grab a reference. Then if the graphic isn't null, we'll set the color of the graphic to the color in the color reference class. Notice here we don't need to do the dot value due to our implicit cast. Adding an onInspector GUI attribute to the color reference will ensure that when we adjust the color in the inspector or drop in a new scriptable object, the color of the graphic will stay updated. Now it's important to note that this attribute will only call the adjust color function on an instance of this class when its inspector is being drawn, which means that adjusting the color on the scriptable object will not automatically change the color of all the UGUI elements. So to make our solution a bit more robust, we can add an onEnable function that will call the adjustColor function. While our colors won't be 100% synchronized in the editor at all times, they will be when entering play mode or when the object is turned on during runtime. So there you go. We hope that was interesting or better yet, useful for you and your project. And until next time, happy game designing.